saved or whether all is well they say we only can hope and trust that it is so I was there when it happened and I guess I ought to know yes I know when Jesus saved me the very moment he forgave me he took away my heavy burden and he gave me peace within Satan can't make me doubt it it's real and I'm gonna shout it I was there when it happened and I guess I ought to know well don't try and tell me salvation is not real though the world may argue that we cannot feel the heavy burden lifted and the vile sin go I was there when it happened and I guess I ought to know yes I know when Jesus saved me the very moment he forgave me he took away my heavy burden and he gave me peace within Satan can't make me doubt it it's real and I'm gonna shout it I was there when it happened And I guess I ought to know Yes, I was there when it happened And I guess I ought to know Appreciate the song tonight, all the singing this evening and the Words of the songs that have been sung and able to rejoice together. It's a privilege to be able to introduce uh, Brother Pratt to preach tonight, and I guess he, uh, he and I go back around 20 some years, and the first time I had to meet Brother Pratt was not under ideal circumstances. It was at a McDonald's in Palmer, Alaska, <laughs> and we had to meet uh, to discuss a difficult circumstance. And neither of us were in any error or wrong, but we had to meet <clears throat> to discuss something. And at that point, I was a very, very young minister. I guess some of you still call me a young minister, but I was very, very young, okay? And uh, I was scared to death of getting together to talk with him about this thing. And he was incredibly kind to me and uh, listened, and we had good discussion, and uh, I did not realize that in that moment where I was just terrified, but trying to do what I believe was the best thing, uh, that God was building the foundation for a friendship uh, and a mentorship that would last decades. And uh, when he left North Star, uh, he and his wife, Sister Pratt, who is just as wonderful as he is, um, came to the anchor and eventually joined and they uh, walked with us through many uh, dangers, toils and snares and uh, were there for us and just like a set of parents um, and loved us and encouraged us and Brother Pratt uh, could ruin me. <laughs> I've been able to bear my heart to him and share the depths of all sorts of things with him and uh, he was just just loved me and helped me and I, I owe him and his wife uh, an immeasurable debt of gratitude and uh, I know my wife feels the same way and they have uh, they've uh, I mentioned just been surrogate grandparents to my kids and and uh, we, we love them very very much and they have many gifts they're wonderful singers Brother Pratt is an excellent song leader and um, Sister Pratt is an excellent cook, and you've not lived till you've had Sister Sue's fried pies. And I was thinking to myself, why didn't I have her teach Anna to make those while she was here this weekend? But perhaps another time. Anyway, um, he loves the Lord. 
He loves Jesus Christ. And, and it, it, don't just say that. You can see it in the way he's lived and the sacrifices he's made uh, in his ministry. And he's currently pastor at Bay Springs Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, for a little while, he's trying to, to resign. They don't really like that idea. But um, I commend to you tonight for your, your attention, uh, Brother Charlie Pratt. Bless you, brother. Let me get my little buddy over here beside me. I ask that you would overlook my obvious disabilities, but uh, God, the Lord is blessed. The issue that I have is a, a lung issue that it's not from, well, <laughs> I never heard of it before, but it, it's from rheumatoid arthritis. And instead of attacking my joints and things, it's attacking my lungs. So uh, I have talked with the doctors, and uh, honestly, I was supposed to be dead two years ago, but God's not done with me yet, so we'll continue to do that. And I've told my doctors uh, a couple of years ago, I feel incredibly blessed. I think it's a miracle that with my lung condition, I can sing, I can preach, and I can do that. And I said, I think it's a miracle. And my doctor said, really? I said, yes. And he said, I do too. You can actually do those things? Said, yes. But it is a miracle. So we're a part of a miracle that God has ongoing. And I'm very glad of that. And I appreciate God. I, I thank him for that regularly. Uh, after the introduction this afternoon, I need, I think I feel just I need to sit down. It'll all go downhill from there. <laughs> One thing I will agree with what he said. The better part of my relationship is sitting right over there. She's, uh, every place we've ever been, everybody likes her a lot more than they do me. Uh, Sue is a, a wonderful, wonderful, sweet lady. Uh, next weekend, uh, we will celebrate our 51st wedding anniversary. Amen. So it, it's actually on April 2nd. 51 years ago, April 2nd, was Easter Sunday. I won't go into all of that, but uh, young people, be careful with blind dates. You may wind up married to them for a long, long time. <laughs> it is good to be here. Love the Keene family deeply. We've, we've been through some wonderfully glorious times. And we have been through some incredibly difficult times. And God is gracious. I, I admire him and Sister Mary for their strength. They won't call it strength. They'll call it grace. But I thank God for them. Turn with me this evening. <laughs> for the, and you, you know where we're going always. Always go to Hebrews. It's, 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 always, it's always been one of my favorite passages in the scriptures, the book of Hebrews. And I believe, myself, I believe that the Apostle Paul wrote this. And the way that he approaches this book, and what he's doing is he's taking the Old Testament. He's taking the law, he's taking the prophets, he's taking the, all of these things, and he is showing how that God used them and the utility and the wisdom and the perfection of what God has done. And then he takes this and compares it to Christ and says, now let me show you how Christ is far better than this. That we have trusted and loved the law and the things of the old covenant and have, have secured in them for years but he said, Christ has fulfilled all of that. And let me show you how he takes all of the promises, all of the things that were there, perfects them, and sustains them eternally. I want to use one verse of scripture to begin with this evening. It is in Hebrews chapter 4. Very short verse, verse 9. 
That verse is this. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. May I ask you a question? How many of you get tired? Even in the service. Even in the service of the Lord. Do you just sometimes just get exhausted? <laughs> After a week like this, we do that, don't we? Have you ever been in a revival, a revival season where you go several nights, even sometimes several weeks, night after night, perhaps a couple of services a day, and on and on and on and on. And while you're going through the course of those services, you know, you're, you're a little tired, but you get, you, know, you get by, and at the end of that, all of a sudden you realize how exhausted you actually are. It just, it, it just all of a sudden, it just deflates. And the Lord helps in our infirmities. He helps in our tired. He helps in all of our weaknesses and uh, gives us strength, gives us encouragement along the way. This verse, there remaineth therefore a rest of the people of God. I want to back up a little bit and give you the context that this is written. This is written in conjunction with his reporting or his telling of the children of Israel in bondage, after they get out of bondage, and when they are entering into the wilderness and about to enter the promised land. And he uses this as God has told them in chapter 3, uh, in uh, verse, beginning in verse 7, he talks about how that they're to not harden their hearts as in the provocation. He goes on down verse 10. He says, I was grieved with that in generation and said they do always err in their hearts. They have not known my way, so I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. And he goes on today, uh, goes on and talks about how that they are to encourage one another, not harden your hearts, and uses this illustration of Israel being taken away from the rest that God had promised them and said they could not enter because of unbelief. Hold your finger there in Hebrews and turn with me back into the book of Exodus in chapter 19. As I was looking through this and studying this, I encountered some things I've known for many, many years, but it was freshened in my mind again about what God did when they came out of Egypt. In chapter 19 of Exodus, beginning in verse 1, it says, In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai, for they had, were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness. And there Israel went up, or Moses went up into God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob and the children of Israel. Now listen to what God tells the children of Israel in his first communication with them after they came out. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, keep my covenant, then, it shall, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So Moses does this. He goes down and he tells the people that, and the people tell him in verse 8, all that the Lord has spoken we will do, and Moses returned the words to the Lord. So the Lord told him, get the people ready. Prepare yourselves. Wash yourselves, just get ready, and after three days I'm going to appear and I will talk to the people. Well, he goes on down and in verse 16, it says, And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. Moses brought forth of the people 
uh, brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether in a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and a whole mount quaked greatly. When the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. Now, I'm, I'm not going to read all of this, but he goes on and he communicates with Moses and with the, the children of Israel. And in, verse, in uh, chapter 20, we have the giving of the, the Ten Commandments and the beginning of the law and all of these things. And, and God is actually speaking and the people are hearing. And the people, they fell completely back away from all of this in chapter 20 at the conclusion of the giving of the Ten Commandments, in verse 18, it says this, All the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet, the smoke, mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off, and they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. Let not God speak with us, lest we die. God, in the previous chapter, has said, You've seen how that I led you out of Egypt. I brought you here on eagle's wings. That's synonymous with I brought you here by grace. He brought them out of Egypt completely free and wealthy to the extent that, in my opinion, they were carrying 400 years of back wages. They were wealthy people. And they came out. They approached the Red Sea and God allowed them to go across on dry ground. There was no works involved in what they did. God gave them grace. He opened up the sea and they went across. They were hungry. God gave them manna from heaven. They were thirsty. God gave them water from a rock. God took care of them on, in grace, they did nothing for it. God took them to this place and he said, I have brought you here completely by grace. And my intention is that if you will obey my voice and keep my commandment, you will be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the people of the earth. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. God talked to them. They listened they told Moses, uh-uh, we, we can't handle that. You go talk to him. We'll, we'll, we'll listen. We'll, we'll do what you said. Well, if you go on over about, uh, oh, I don't remember now exactly which one it is. But several chapters, we have the lessons, or we have what Moses is listening to God. The people, in chapter 34, No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Back up two chapters. Back in chapter 32. When Moses was done with all of this, he came down and the people had misbehaved. Last verse in chapter 31. Remember we started in chapter 20 with the, the giving of these laws. Moses finished up in chapter 31, verse 18. He gave an end unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai. The two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the hand of God. As Moses approaches, he's been gone now for 40 days. A wild party is going on and they have fabricated the golden calf and they have turned away from the God that they had already promised just a few days before. We'll do whatever you say. We, 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 we just want to follow you. Well, this is the first of many places where they blatantly looked at God and said, no. God said, I want you to do this. And they said, nope, we, don't want, we want something else. It, this is repeated many times through the history of, the, of Israel. I love, I love Jeremiah. Jeremiah, he preached to them and, and they said, he said, you look for the old paths. We're in the right way. And they said, no, we will not walk therein. Isaiah preached to them. They refused. All of the old prophets, they talked to them about, about what God wanted them to do. And they 
simply refused. We're reminded of that when Jesus was here, when he's overlooking the city of Jerusalem, and he just, I, I can just see him as he stands and he weeps over the city, and he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest those that I have sent unto you, how often would I have gathered you together as a hen would gather her chicks, and you would not. Behold, I leave unto you your house desolate. With this stiff-necked and rebellious people, God told, because of your disobedience, because of your refusal, because of your unbelief, you will not enter into my rest. His desire was that they would be a people of God and that by grace, he would lead them and protect them and give them of his goodness and of his glory. And they refused and he said, okay, if that's the way you want it, so be it. So the Hebrew writer is reminding us of these things. And he said that, that it is because of their unbelief that they were not allowed to go into that place. And that God's intention was laid aside because of their unbelief. In chapter 3, he goes on to say in verse 14, We are made partakers of Christ if we behold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcass fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that he would not uh, enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. The entering into rest is what we want to look at for a little bit because the next chapter goes on down through even the part that we read to begin with. It talks about how that rest is said. You know, there are two words that are used or two meanings of the words rest that are used here. One is at a period when you are physically emotionally tired and you need to lay down and rest for a little while. And then the Lord is also talking about an eternal rest that remains ahead. So we need rest from time to time and we look forward to an eternal rest when we leave this life. And they're kind of interwoven in there where it's kind of hard to tell exactly which one he's talking about as he goes through it. But he says, uh, verse 2 of chapter 4, Unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. And he said, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. And then he goes in and he talks about how God rested on the seventh day. And that rest that it talks about there was when God had completely finished all of the work of creation. It was completed, completely done. There was no need for a temporary rest. It was satisfied. It was done. He took an eternal rest and God's work is done from the foundation of the world. It's done. Nothing else for him to do. We are not in that place yet. We are at a place where we work and we labor. And we get tired. Sometimes we get frustrated. Sometimes we get discouraged. Sometimes we want to lay aside. Sometimes we want to just, just sometimes we want to do like Jeremiah. Just, I, I, I just, I wanted to go out into the wilderness and just get away from it all. But he said, but the word of the Lord was shut up in me, up in my bones like fire. And, and God wouldn't let him do it. But the weariness that we have the exhaustion that we experience. It's, it's difficult to work through sometimes, isn't it? He talks about how that sometimes our labors are sweet and the rest is sweet. Sometimes our labors are difficult and a, and a rest is labored. And we struggle with this concept. You know, 
all of us, or I myself, I'm always thinking I need to do more. Yeah, I, I need to visit more. I need to pray more. I need to study more. I need to do more for the Lord. And I just, there, there is just, there's never a place where I say I've done all I can do. I'm always looking that, and thinking I need to do more. But then in verse 8, he said, if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward had said, has spoken of another rest, but there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. He that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man uh, fall after the same example of unbelief. Now, I don't know whether that has ever bothered you or not, but... What rest is he talking about here? Let us labor to enter into that rest. Well, I've heard people, you know, some say, well, that's, that's salvation. I didn't work for my salvation. That was one of the things that God completed. That was done. That was satisfied by God. Jesus Christ died on the cross to secure that. I did nothing for my salvation. God drew me. God saved me. And God secures me. My salvation is secured without the benefit of my labor. Amen. Then what's he talking about? I know it tells us in, in Ephesians chapter 2. He said, you know, it's not by works lest any man should boast. But he goes on to say, for we is his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works that God hath before ordained. We should walk therein. So after that we have been saved, God expects us to labor in his vineyard. We're workers. We're workers in the vineyard of the Lord. Jesus said in the 15th chapter of John, I am the vine, you are the branches. And he goes on, you know, he's the head. We are the workers and all of those things. So there is a work for us to do. So what is he talking about? The laboring, the rest, is that salvation? You, what, what is he, what, what's he looking at? As I get older, I see things differently than I did when I was young. I go on a little bit further in this chapter and it introduces me to something that for a long time, I, well, that just seems a little out of place. He's talking about a rest, laboring, a rest that is ahead. He tells us now in verse 13, well, verse 12, the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Uh, he goes on 13, and neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto him, uh, under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And then we get into the very familiar phrase regarding Christ as a high priest that almost seems out of context here. He's talking about labor, he's talking about unbelief, he's talking about not rest, all of these things. And then he introduces Jesus and he said, seeing then that we have a high priest that, that uh, is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin." Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. How does that work or how does that fit with what he has been talking about? This concept or this discussion of labor and rest. Again, I'm not going to ask you to go back over there, but in go back into the Old Testament and you look at the duties of a priest. You look at some of the things, and just, just so you know, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1 is this. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. So he's starting, consider Jesus Christ, the high priest. Chapter 3, 
chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. Chapter 8 begins with this. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty of the heavens, a minister of the true sanctuary, uh, of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. So all of this that we have been reading and taking a bit here and there, that's all a part of the discussion that goes on for five chapters that is regarding Jesus Christ as our high priest. Well, what's the purpose of this then? Look at chapter 5. Keep in mind where, where we've come from. Chapter 5 in Hebrews. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained of men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way for they, that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof, he ought, also, or ought as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. So as we are laboring, as we are trying to honor God, as we are struggling and trying for the rest, Jesus Christ comes onto the scene. And Jesus Christ is now, because he has earned it and has been appointed to that, he is our high priest, the holy, the, the, the apostle and high priest of our profession is Jesus Christ. And as it says that the high priest's purpose was to have compassion on the ignorant, I'm well blessed with that. The ignorance is not stupidity, ignorance is you just don't know. I've not, just You don't know. And there's a lot of things that I don't know. And I'm glad that God has compassion on the ignorant. I am glad that God has, uh, uh, let's see, is compassion on the ignorant, on them that are out of the way, and that he offers for sins. If you go back and you look in the old, the old law again, you find where God instituted the Levitical priesthood. What that was all about. How that they were sanctified as the, the tribe dedicated to serve God in the priesthood. How that they were the substitute for the firstborn of every family. And how that God sanctified and consecrated them to himself for all of that. And carried that all the way down to this point in time. And now this Hebrew writer is saying, okay, let me show you how the, all of these things we trusted, how of all these things we fell short because of unbelief, and all of these things, all of these things God used for 1,500 years. And he said, now let me show you how Christ is better than all of those. Amen. We turn over here. Chapter 8 and verse 3. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. What was it that he was able to offer that the high priest before him could not? For one thing, he satisfied all of the requirements of the law of God. He did not come to destroy the law in his words. He came to fulfill the law. He came to do the will of his Father. He came to honor God and obey God in every respect in his entire life. Why were they not allowed to enter into the rest? Because of their unbelief. Why was he accepted as a high priest to offer sacrifices for us? It was because of his obedience to who God is and what God desired and what God demanded. Jesus took care of that. So I go back to the original question, what is he talking about when I am tired, when I am exhausted, when I'm trying to labor, when I'm trying to do what God wants me to do and I get discouraged and I get down and all of those things. And when I get into that place, what is he talking about? I'm laboring for this rest. I want to draw your attention to a very familiar Passage of scripture that's in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11 
Jesus says this. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Do you really want rest? Jesus is the only place you're going to find it in this life. There is, a, there is a rest that comes after this, but that's because of Jesus as well. The strength that we have to labor, the strength, the desire that we have to work with God and for God, it comes from Jesus Christ. The desire to satisfy or the desire to serve God, Jesus Christ did that. We love God because He loved us. I can of myself do nothing. That Jesus said this of himself. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I see, I judge, and my judgment is just. He said, seek not my own will, but the will of the Father that sent me. When we get tired, when we get exhausted, Jesus has a standing invitation. All you that labor are heavy laden. Come unto me. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, as I get older, you would think you'd know more after a while. But that doesn't really seem to be the case with me. I seem to have to learn everything all the time. But I'm, I'm beginning to learn that when I get exhausted, only place I can really find rest for my soul is in the presence of Jesus. He's been there. He has carried all of this burden alone. No one stood with him. No one went with him. No one stood with him. He carried all of this burden for the redemption of all of mankind completely alone and carried it to the cross and died and took his own blood into the presence of God and gave himself as a ransom and a sacrifice for all of mankind. It satisfied the, the requirements of God. Jesus said, I can give you rest. When I begin to remember how little that I do, and when I get frustrated because I can or won't do more, when I get tired of seemingly hitting a brick wall, when I just get overwhelmed by things of this world, I just can remember Jesus said, when all of this happens, when you get tired, when you get weary, we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy or find, uh, find grace uh, and may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. What is the rest that we desire? Our end is we desire that heavenly eternal rest, but none of us are there yet. But I think each one of us do get exhausted from time to time in our walk with the Lord. I think when we try to take too much on ourselves, we find that it's a burden we cannot bear alone. We get tired. If you're lost, You've tried to come to God of your own benefits. You've tried to come to God of your own resources and you cannot do it. And you get discouraged. I've seen lost people get discouraged and, and just get just frustrated because I've done everything you've said. I've prayed. I've not saved. It's just that they get mad at God because they think they've done everything God said. They haven't turned to Jesus or he'd save them. He said... Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. It seems almost like an oxymoron, doesn't it? If you're carrying your burden and it's heavy, Jesus said, well, take my burden. Well, I don't want your burden to. Mine's heavy enough. Jesus said, no. If you take my burden, I'll carry yours. I'll take care of yours. <clears throat> the sweetest peace 
And the sweetest rest you will ever know in this world is the rest that Jesus gives you when he stills your heart. I don't remember who it was. Just some of you, we've been in church every day for a week, so I don't remember which, which, which one it was. It may have been here. But someone was talking about when they, their, their child went to the altar and how that they went with them to the altar and they were seeking after God. He said, as soon as I knelt there beside my child, God told me right then, there's no need to pray. I got this taken care of. He said, I just stood up. He said, I didn't know what to do. He said, two minutes later, the child got up rejoicing because God had saved their soul. Been a couple of times over the years that God has given me a, a confirmation in my heart that what you're praying for, I have taken care of. I was in a revival one time several years ago. And over a course of about three nights, we had 15 different people on the altar. And nobody was getting saved. And I was up all night. I lived out on a, in the country. And I was walking around that hillside. I was crying out to God. I was praying. I was just, uh, just so concerned that, you know, why are we not seeing, why is nobody being saved? And during the course of that, it was long about four o'clock in that morning. And I'd actually just walked over to my old pickup and I had just leaned across the hood of the truck and I was just leaning there praying and crying, just crying out to God about what was going on. And God gave me a peace in my heart. It was as if he said, there's no more need to pray. I'll take care of this. It scared me. The first time that it ever happened, it scared me. And we went back to church the next night. I could not get a burden for those lost people. And I thought, have I gone so far that God won't even let me pray for them anymore? But nobody got saved during the course of that revival. And I thought, wow, that's, that's odd. You know, over the next two years, every one of those got saved. A few years later, we were at a revival at a sister church. And I was sitting in the back. I had two nephews that were in that church. That night they uh, went to the, and the altar call. They both went to the altar. I went up and knelt on the front bench and was praying. And suddenly there was, there was no more need to pray. And I didn't understand that. And just a couple of minutes later, Christopher, my nephew, got up off the altar, came over and sat right down beside me. And I looked up at him, I was knelt there, and I looked up at him, and he smiled, and he said, I'm saved. So God can give you a rest, even though you don't know where it's coming from or what it's all about, but God can confirm to you he is in control, and your labors for that particular portion, he's heard, he's taken care of that. That's some of the sweetest memories that I have is when God has brought a confirmation. He has heard my prayers. He has seen the labors. He has seen what is going on. I'm going to read one verse of scripture from chapter, 10, chapter 6, verse 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. I was reminded of this this morning in Sunday school class when we were talking about the impact that this church has had on some of the uh, surrounding areas. How that some of the people of Vacation Bible School, how that they were saved somewhere else. And how that some of the things that were being said were being heard in other places and how, you know, the, the recommendations. And it was said how that, that God is blessing because of these things. Even though you didn't see the direct results here, you know, this, this verse came to my mind and said, God is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love. He knows everything. He sees our labors, he sees our frustrations, he sees our care, he sees all of these things, 
And when we really get tired, when we really get exhausted, when we really get worn out, Jesus says, come unto me. Let me give you some rest. Let me, let, let me take care of these things for a while. God is a marvelous God. Jesus is a wonderful Savior. And God is one who is able to do far abundantly more than we could ever even think of. I thank God for His goodness. I thank God for His temporary rest. And I am so looking forward to that eternal rest when we leave this life and we're in the presence of God for all of eternity. Thank God for His goodness. Brother James. Some really good thoughts there. We need to lean into Jesus. I know a lot of us are carrying a lot of different burdens, carrying a lot of different concerns. And you know, we talk a lot about the peace that you can know. We talk about that to the lost. You know, and you have a burden and you're convicted and you need to seek the Lord until He gives you peace. But sometimes we, we don't remind ourselves as much that the peace can be just as real after you're saved and different circumstances and things come into your life and we really can get overwhelmed. But that is the beauty of our Lord and Savior is that He can give us a peace that passes understanding, a peace that does not make sense for the circumstances, the things we're going through. And I appreciated explaining that from the Word and pointing us to our Lord and Savior and just reminding us to lean on into Him he was talking about that passage in Exodus about the Lord talking to the Israelites saying, if you obey me, you'll be a peculiar treasure to me. Out of everybody in the world, the way Jesus put it is, if you hear and obey, you're my family. Mm -hmm. Right? We talked about that this morning. You're, you're my family. And I tell you, we understand family, don't we? You understand as a parent, seeing your kids struggle with something and you just want to help them. You want to you take a burden? Our Father's no different. And our Father's made a way if we just lean on into Him. I appreciate that message tonight so much. And I hope that whatever, whatever you stand in need of tonight, whatever you're laboring and burdened with tonight, that you would be encouraged to, to lean into Jesus. Someone this evening...